It's a great day to be alive, to be here at First Baptist Church, and to worship the Lord God Almighty. Thank you for being here today in God's house. Would you stand and welcome those around you to worship? We're glad you're here. <laughs>
Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. This is Memorial Day weekend, and a lot of folks are gone, but a lot of others have come in. And maybe that's you. You're in our area because of the holiday. We welcome you, especially to First Baptist today. If you'll take your program, you'll notice there's a place where we ask information. If you're comfortable doing it, fill that out for us and tear it off. And the last thing we'll do is receive our offering today, and you could put that in. We'd love to know where you're from. And if you're in our area, we'd love to have you come back again and again. Even consider making this your church home. We'd love to have you be a part of things here. Would you pray with me, please? God, we are gathered here this morning because you summoned us to come. You've invited us into your presence, and we come joyfully. So, Lord, as we sing and pray and hear the scriptures proclaimed, we pray that Christ, being exalted, will draw people to himself. Lord, I pray that you would move in the hearts of your people today. Bless those who are traveling, those who are far away from us, those who are sick or have some other need. Minister to them and bring them back to us soon. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for the great singing today. Please be seated. Thank you. The freedoms we enjoy as Americans, the freedom to speak our mind, say what we feel in our hearts to say, gather in an assembly like this for worship as we believe we're called to do, or not, depending on our faith or lack of it, we have those liberties. All of this is God-given, and it's protected by the military might of our country over the centuries, guarding and taking care of us. Since the Revolutionary War for our American independence, well over a million men and women have given their lives in the ultimate sacrifice to preserve those precious liberties. Today, many are currently in the military or have been in time gone by. Some are in their uniforms, others are not. But if you have served or are serving now in the military of the United States, would you stand please? We'd like to thank you for that. Thank you. My wife is much better at it than I am. She never passes somebody in uniform without thanking them for their service. And that's a good habit we should all get into. I want us to pray together about those who've lost their lives. Father, we thank you for our freedoms, for every blessing that has come from you. And we thank you for those who've paid the ultimate sacrifice. These who just stood were willing to do that, but others have actually done it on fields of battle, and we remember them today. We thank you for their sacrifice, and we pray your blessings upon their families. Lord, may we be faithful as citizens, shining in this world to make a difference for Christ, giving the best we have as well. Through Christ we pray. Amen. It is our custom at First Baptist Church on Memorial Day Sunday to do something that really has no official attachment to that. We've just chosen to do this, and that is to remember our own church people who have died since last May, since last Memorial Day. And we call their names because their names should be called from time to time so that we don't forget. And the names are listed on the back of your program if you would turn there. This is our best effort to find these names. If we've missed somebody, please let us know. When I read the names, I'll pause just a second. And if you are a family member of any one of these, if you would stand and then be seated. James U.D. Mary Maupin. Leo Chappie Stannis. Manuel Gonzalez, Evelyn Etridge, Rachel Mills, Henry Rice, Elise Caldwell, Alan Davis, Barbara Fonstock, Rebecca Hall, Jay Toman, John Stanfield. And we just received word that one of our non-resident members from years ago, Pat Kuhlman, passed away on Friday. Many of you will remember Pat, so we add her name to this list. These are precious ones who served Christ along with you in years gone by, and we thank God for their memory now.
Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> Wonderful. What a blessing. I want Emily Holmes to come up here. Emily, you want to sing for us, Emily? <laughs> Come on out here. I want you to meet this young lady. I think you already know her. Emily, uh, you grew up at First Baptist, didn't you? And uh, last summer, Southern Baptist asked a special favor of you, and you did it, and they've asked again. What are you doing this summer? I will be leaving on Saturday to fly to Nashville, and I'll be meeting up with my team and going to three different states to serve with Center Kid Camps, which is a week-long overnight camp for third through sixth graders. Now, we send our ch children to Centric Kid one week every summer. You'll be leading camps all over the South. Is that right? Mm -hmm. My team is going to Tennessee, Florida, and Maryland. Wow. Well, we're so proud of you, and we will miss you here, but we'll pray for you while you're gone. So I want to pray right now for you. Thank you, Lord, for calling one of our own as an ambassador for Christ, an ambassador for our church, to make a difference in the lives of children. So be with Emily. Take care of her. Keep her healthy and happy and make uh, her fruitful in her work this summer. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, dear. Would you take your copy of God's Word, please, and turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, the first 10 verses. My message this morning is entitled, You Must Remember This. Some things to be remembered since it's Memorial Day. Uh, a reminder of important things. Chapter 2, verse 1. And uh, there are notes in your program. You could also go to our First Baptist app, and there, there are even more notes there that could help you as you follow along. Verse 1, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is God's word for God's people today. Thanks be to God. 20th century rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel once wrote, much of what the Bible demands can be comprised in one imperative, remember. It's a key word in the Old Testament and then again, as we just read, in the New Testament, the call to remember. And since it's Memorial Day in American history, the word remember often was used as a war cry. Remember the Alamo, remember the Maine, remember Pearl Harbor. And it was a summons forward to fight for liberty and for freedom. This word remember we're talking about today is not a call for nostalgia. Nostalgia has its place to thinking back, remembering uh, fonder days. But that can be crippling. Goethe tells in his greatest poem of Faust, who lost the liberty of his soul when he said to a passing moment, stay, stay for you are fair. And we've all had those moments in our lives when something happens and we grab onto it and we say, stay, it'll never be better than this. And we stay right where we are and never move again. 
Nostalgia can cripple you. The kind of memory I'm talking about is that which inspires us and challenges us and moves us forward. Second Timothy is Paul's last writing. The year is A.D. 66. He's in a Roman prison cell, dark and damp. He's all by himself. And he knows he's going to die. He doesn't know exactly when, but he he knows it soon. The time of my departure is at hand. He'll say in chapter 4, I've fought a good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. So he knows it's happening. And while he's waiting, he starts remembering. And he tells us the things he's remembering, and he encourages us. I'm very aware as a pastor that one of my jobs, one of my most important jobs, well, it's not to stand here on Sundays and tell you something you've never heard of before, never thought of, to spin out some new theology. My main task is simply to remind you of what you already know. What you learned a long, long time ago in vacation Bible school or Centra Kid or Sunday worship services, just to remind you. Paul goes on to say in chapter 2, verse 14, keep reminding them, Timothy, of all these things. So that's what I want to do today. May I list a few of the things I believe we need to remember now and always. First of all, we're to remember those who have blessed and ministered to us along the way. In every one of our lives, we can look back and see somebody who made a real difference in our lives. We, we haven't read this yet, but look back up in chapter 1. Chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, verse 15. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. And he names a couple of people. Friends who've forgotten their promises... Maybe not unkind, just hard to find. They're not there. May the Lord show mercy, however, to the household of Anesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. He gives a whole paragraph to a man we'll not hear of again, Onesiphorus. He's mentioned in chapter 4, verse 19, where Paul sends a greeting to his family. They live in Ephesus. But what Paul is telling us is, here's a guy who when everybody else walked out, he walked in. And he often refreshed me. And when he heard I was in prison, he had a hard time finding me, but he found me. He was persistent. He refused to let me go. You got anybody like that in your life? When in the darkest moment of your life, when you couldn't find a friend, they showed up at your office door or they came by your house or that hospital bed and they refreshed you. I love that word, refreshed. Is there anybody in your life, no matter what you're going through, they walk through the door and the whole mood changes? Well, that's who it is for you. You don't need a lot of folks like that in your life, but if you've got a few, and I think you'll find some of them right here at First Baptist, they make all the difference. Who in your life was the refresher of your soul? Remember them. Talk about them. Tell others about them as the days go on. Here's the second thing. We need to remember to do the same for somebody else to bless and minister to others. Somebody did it for you, now turn around and see who's behind you, who's coming up through the ranks, and you take that baton and you pass it on to them. Chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Find somebody with unique gifts and availability and openness and pour your life into their soul. 
Are you visualizing anybody right now that you could do that for? Somebody you could bless? I was traveling some this week, and yesterday I was in the Atlanta airport, and I was, uh, Audrey was seated, and I, I was some distance away looking at the board, and while I was trying to figure out all that it was saying, there was a young woman behind me, and she asked me a question. She said, what's this about? What, do you, what does it mean? And I explained it to her, and then we just began a conversation. We just started talking. I had a long time before my flight. And I asked her about her life. She was young, and she was, I found out she was a student at Auburn. And uh, she said she was on her way to New York City. So I took a guess and said, are you going there to be an intern? And she said, yes, I am. And she told me where and what the field was. And so we talked for a while. And she told me about her. She began talking about her life. But as she talked about her life, she was telling me more about her father than about herself. She, she gave her father's story that in his younger days, he was something of a rounder, but he had met the Lord. His life had changed, and now he was serving God. And her face just lit up as she talked about her dad. And, and so I asked her, you know, where's your hometown? And she said, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And I could have guessed Alabama just from the way she was speaking. Montgomery, Alabama. I said, do you go to a church in Montgomery, Alabama? And she said, yes, I go to First Baptist Church of Montgomery. I said, well, your pastor is one of my best friends. And we just rejoiced in talking about how much she loved her church and how much she loved her pastor. And uh, I, we went on to talk about going to New York, and I recommended a few churches she should go to while she was in that city. And then it was time to say goodbye, and she went on and boarded, and I went and waited for my flight. I hope on this day of transition for her, as she was beginning something new, she had to be a little nervous, maybe a little frightened to, to leave Auburn, to leave Montgomery, and to go to New York City. I hope I was a blessing and an encouragement to her as she left. But what a blessing she was to me as she talked about somebody who had made a difference in her life. I went back to my seat, and I got out my phone, and I texted Jay Wolf, the pastor there at First Baptist Montgomery. And I told him, I just met this young lady and uh, how she loves him and loves the church. And Jay immediately wrote back and, and said, yes, I know Aaron. Her father, so now Jay's talking about her father too. Her father is an all-star champion in the kingdom of God. And she is a chip off that solid block. Now here's a dad who had invested in his child and passed on to her a baton she'll take to New York City and who knows where in her life she got it from somebody who invested in her. I want to invest in people's lives and I hope that you do too. Here's the third thing to remember. Remember to stay disciplined for the duration we talked the last several Sundays, we've talked about the seven habits of highly effective Christians. Now, knowing them, it's time to put them into practice. And it all boils down to disciplines in our lives, day in and day out. We don't let them slip. We don't lay them aside. We stay at it. And Paul talks here about being like a soldier. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you've never worn a uniform. Maybe you've never served in the armed forces. But if you're a Christian, you're in the Lord's army. And uh, there's no killing involved. There's only giving life involved. But it's standing true. And just like a soldier has to be focused and not get entangled with civilian affairs, you and I in this generation need to stay focused and not get entangled in the things of the world so that we can't serve effectively. Soldiers experience life as a different sort of reality. It's a different way they view things. And that's how we are to do as Christians. And then he says, like athletes, athletes who endure training, who master their bodies, they're constantly training. If they're going to be in the Olympic Games, they start very young and they're always working at it, and they're always exercising. They're staying in shape season by season. They never forget they need to be ready to run the race. 
and to win. And then he talks about farmers. Now, maybe you can relate to that. Maybe there's a farmer in the house. Farmers who have to plan ahead, who, who sow and then reap, who have to be very patient as the crops grow. The farmer who has to keep in the down season has to keep his equipment sharp and ready for when the season begins. You don't know what the challenges are going to be in the days to come. You, you never know what you're going to face day by day, so you keep your, your equipment sharp and ready. Sometimes you have to wait for that moment, but that moment comes, and then you share and make a difference in the world. Stay disciplined. Keep your eyes on the prize. The fourth thing we are to remember, we're to remember to extend the gospel to other people. To extend the gospel to other people. Look at chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I put up with everything. Even this prison cell, he said, I'm here in defense of the gospel because I have an obligation to share Christ, to become all things to all men, that by all means I might be able to win some to faith in Christ. You and I need to remember that people outside of faith in Christ are lost. You meet them every day. You encounter them. You rub shoulders with them on the metro. You, you're beside them in the office. You, you sit close to them in a classroom. They might live right across the street from you, and they don't know Christ. Muslim people are as religious as anybody. It's Ramadan, and, and you can see their devotion. Muslims have a prophet, but they don't have a savior. You have a Savior who died to give you life. Are you involved right now in any gospel conversations with anybody? Are you talking about Jesus to anybody? And what he's done and what he's done in your life? We need to begin those conversations so that others can find life. And then lastly, this is number five, and it's the most important one. It's in verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ. Now, you would think that wouldn't need to be said, but it does. Because we get so caught up in life in this world. We get our focus diverted in so many different directions. We, we forget Jesus. Who he is and what he says and what he does and how he thinks. And we're to have that same sort of life, vocabulary, response. So that when something's happening around us, our first thought is, Jesus. What does Jesus think about this situation? What would Jesus say? How would he respond to that person? Remember Jesus Christ. Raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. Remember Jesus. Go back to chapter 1 and look at verse 10. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Remember, now you'll need to remember this this week because you're going to deal with this. This awful subject of death. It'll invade a family close to you or it'll happen in the news and you'll read about it. Death is that final enemy. The scripture, Paul is telling us that Christ defeated destroyed death. And the word he uses for destroyed means to render powerless. It still happens. And yes, people will die and you will die. But he's taken the sting out of it. He's, he's taken its ultimate power. He's destroyed death. That's the good news of the gospel. And look at verse 12. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced, I am persuaded that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him 
for that day. Paul believes he's going to die soon. He knows that the ultimate power of death has been taken away, but he's still got to go through it. He's still going to die. But here's what he knows, and this is his confidence, that once upon a time, he had committed himself, his soul, his body, his life, every part of his life, all his resources, everything, he had committed it all to Jesus. And what he had committed to Jesus, Jesus is safeguarding still. He's in, the, he's in the grip of God. God's got his hand all over him, holding him tight and will not let him go. And he won't let you go either. Remember Jesus. Remember what he did for you and remember what he's doing for you right now. Now, nostalgia will have you remember the day that you gave your heart to Christ when you were a child maybe. Nostalgia will bring to mind the day you got baptized, and that's good, but we don't stop there. Remember Jesus now, and your memory of Jesus should propel you forward into the best days of your life, the greatest service you've ever rendered for him. You must remember this. Let's pray. Would you bow with me, please? You may be here today and you are ready to let us know that you are trusting in Christ. You've invited him into your life, but you've not told anybody. When we sing in a moment, I want you to come to the front and let us know of your commitment. Or maybe today, for the very first time, you're saying yes to Christ. And in weeks to come, we'll baptize you and folks will know of your faith. Perhaps you are here today and you've come week after week and God has put it on your heart that this is the church where you could make a difference, where you could put down roots and serve him. I want you to come and present yourself for membership. We would love to have you. We need you here. So you step out boldly and come. Father, bless now in these moments as people respond to your call. Give them courage to step out, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand, please. God said his son.
those who made the ultimate sacrifice and in service to others, just as we always remember that Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice and laid down his life in service to us. Now we present to you our tithes and offerings, giving back to you a portion of what you have entrusted to us. Lord, we pray that you will bless all the ways that they will be used in order to tell others about Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. 